In the U.S. Army of today, women aren't restricted. Hundreds of military occupational specialties, or MOSs, are open to women, including combat. But that wasn't always the case. Before the United States even existed, women participated in fighting for our freedom. During the Revolutionary War, some women would accompany their husbands into battle, or even disguise themselves as men so they could fight. During the Civil War, women served as nurses and aides, while others took on the roles of spies and smugglers. Over there, over there. During World War I, women typically helped behind the lines, providing comfort as members of the Nursing Corps or the Red Cross. It wasn't until World War II that women were truly incorporated into the United States Army, and Fort Oglethorpe in northwest Georgia played an important and leading role in that progress. A blow and reveille. He's the boogie woogie bugle boy of Company B. They made him blow a bugle for his uncle Sam. Really Fort Oglethorpe was established in 1902 and first used in 1904. During World War I, it was used to house 4,000 German prisoners of war and civilian detainees. When America found itself in another global conflict, Fort Oglethorpe found new life in training a new type of soldier. It was May 14, 1942, when Congress approved Public Law 554, formally establishing the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia was one of five designated training centers for these new women soldiers. Once the facilities were ready, it was time to prepare the women. With the creation of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, every branch of the Army has some sort of insignia that represents it. And so for Colonel Hobby, who was actually Director Hobby, um, set about trying to figure out what that symbol might be. Um, what seemed to be most appropriate was Pallas Athene, uh, the Greek goddess of wisdom and war, and the arts of war as well. It identified them first and foremost as a member of the Women's Army Corps. If you were a young lady and, and you joined the Army between 1942 and 1978, you wore the insignia of the Women's Army Corps. In July 1943, General Eisenhower had asked for women to be sent to him uh, in a post headquarters unit in North Africa, and auxiliaries were not allowed to be sent overseas. Um, so at that time, they started to create the WAC bill, the Women's Army Corps bill. They dropped the auxiliary, and then women at that time were officially enlisted in the Army. Uh, they were given the choice to get out or enlist and continue their service. Uh, the majority of them did choose to stay in. Women were quick to respond to the call for duty and signed up by the thousands. That included women of color. And so the black press took on that responsibility. Say, okay, how do we publicize? How do we put this information that out there in the general community to gather some support for this? And one of those persons who was Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, who said, wow, why should not African-Americans be allowed to enter the military go and fight for this country as others do. At the time, the U.S. military was racially segregated. Units formed were either all white or all black. I volunteered to go overseas, so all of the training was in Oglethorpe, Georgia, and I was transferred down to Fort Oglethorpe. When the enlistees arrived at Fort Oglethorpe, they learned they would be segregated in just about every respect, from training to housing. The unit training at Fort Oglethorpe was prepared for overseas travel and life in the European theater. They would eventually be known as the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion. Its 855 members would be the only all-black women's unit to see overseas duty during World War II. Before their departure, Dr. Bethune, unable to attend, sent a telegram lauding their accomplishment. We are depending upon you. We have much at stake. You represent 15 million of us. Your success in this courageous service is ours. Think well, realize your individual responsibility. 
carve a niche for those who will follow me. God bless you. The women boarded the liner Ile de France on February 3rd, 1945, and set out across the Atlantic Ocean, sailing an evasive course, dodging the enemy. One lady I spoke with said her ship was diverted to Ireland because of the incoming you know, from the German U-boats. Uh, another lady mentioned that they were told, don't change clothes, you know, stay in your uniform because we don't know what's going to happen. So they were confronted, you know, with a combat situation early on before they even arrived. We ended up working in Birmingham, England, which was okay. And while I was there, I uh, doing the serp, the mail service, okay, and that was it. And um, I worked on the day ship. I don't remember working on on the ship. They had three shifts, okay, because this was a 24-hour duty. And that's probably why we were able to get the work done in such a short span of time. We got all the work for the English soldiers, the soldiers that were stationed in England. We got, we got that done in about three months. It was amazing because mail filled three aircraft hangars, stacked up to the ceiling. Some of it had been there for years and contained rotting food. For being a postal battalion, the women were extremely self-sufficient. Our own mess hall, our own supply, our own uh, military police. We had our own transportation, and we had women who did everything. We looked at the service, when we needed something, we looked at the service record to find out what that person had done. With 800 women, we had all kinds of things. Uh, we opened up a beauty parlor. <clears throat> we had beauticians, who we found out who they were, we had beauticians. After showing such skill at their tasks, the wax were then sent to Rouen, France, to do the same thing. It was there that the six Triple Eight suffered their only wartime casualties. Three women, they died in a vehicle accident uh, while they were there, and the Army did not send the bodies back to the United States. And so within the battalion, some ladies had experience with, we call it mortuary affairs. And so they took care of the bodies, you know, I guess they prepped them in terms of, you know, makeup and clothing, and collected money to have a burial in Normandy. In fact, many of the women had experience outside of their military specialties. Many of the women in World War II were recruited because of their skills. Um, so seemingly they had skills beforehand, but it seems that that experience then was able to broaden the horizons in the sense of understanding what they themselves could accomplish would be greater than perhaps what they thought before they had joined. But at the same time, I sometimes wonder how much they, they don't really realize what role models they are for the generations of women that come behind them. Um, because I think as people understand the importance of their stories, especially young men and women in uniform today, and they look at what they accomplished, you know, this part of the greatest generation, even though oftentimes we don't think of women as part of the greatest generation, but they were. For more information on these incredible women who fought a war while fighting racism and sexism, visit the 6th Triple Eight exhibit at the 6th Cavalry Museum in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia.